Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Greater Lynn. I'm Reverend Chris Scheller, Minister of Community Life and Learning here. Uh, we're delighted to be co-hosting this presentation with the Swampscott Conservancy, uh, this talk by Professor Stephen Young on climate change. And I want to offer a warm welcome to uh, those of you viewing from Facebook Live. Thanks for tuning in. Part of our vision here at this church is to host programs like this for the greater community in the North Shore area to address critical issues in the areas such as this, environmental justice, social justice, as well as opportunities for spiritual growth, embodied practices, and much more. Please visit our website, uucgl.org, to see more of the programs we're offering this fall. I can't think of a more important issue to discuss today than the topic at hand. And like most of the big problems, we can't respond sufficiently to the challenge of climate change alone. To this end, we're delighted to be working with the Swampscott Conservancy, uh, through whose hard work and vision this event became possible. And the Conservancy is an all-volunteer, non profit organization dedicated to supporting the town of Swampscott in uh, the preservation of conservation land and open space through education such as tonight's climate change presentation, research and active stewardship. Over its five year history, the Conservancy has opened up new hiking trails, installed native plant gardens, hosted hiking and biking events, cleaned up beaches, and held a variety of talks on subjects ranging from coyotes to eelgrass. The Conservancy's next presentation after tonight, we will also be uh, jointly co-hosting here at UUCGL, will be on December 5th, uh, and it's entitled How to Rid Ourselves of Plastic Pollution by Maria Sabrina Eau Claire. Maria is the founder of Unpacked Living, a boutique in Beverly that promotes an earth-friendly, low-waste and plastic-free lifestyle, and the founder of the local Zero Waste Massachusetts Facebook group. So please join us for that. More about the Conservancy, uh, its mission and past and upcoming events can be viewed on their website, swampscottconservancy.org. To help the Conservancy continue with its efforts in Swampscott and neighboring communities, uh, you are invited to become a member. They wanted me to uh, uh, say that if you're already a member, uh, to renew, remember to renew your membership for 2023. Uh, and you can do that through the website. We hope that tonight's presentation and discussion might contribute to further partnerships and ideas about how we all might work together to respond to the urgent issues we face today. Perhaps you or an organization you're a part of might connect with us and the Conservancy to further the work of understanding and working for change. Let us know. We believe in coalitions and partnerships, and there'll be time for discussion at the end of the presentation. Let us turn our attention now to Dr. Stephen Young, Professor and past chair of the Geology and Sustainability Department at Salem State University. Professor Young's areas of expertise include climate change, deforestation, and studying the Earth from space, space through satellites and drones. It sounds so complicated, I couldn't even say it. Uh, he has a PhD from Clark University, a master's degree from Yale University, and a BA from the University of Vermont. Uh, over 60 environmental related publications and over 25 art gallery exhibitions demonstrating various aspects of science. But most of all, he's a science and climate change educator and that is why we are glad to have him here tonight uh, giving this public talk in addition to the teaching he does in college. We're also uh, thrilled that joining Professor Young tonight is Yaroslava Shuryayeva a senior at Swampscott High School and climate activist who will provide us a youth voice to the urgency of action. So please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Young. Thank you. 
Um, impacts of climate change. They've only just begun. And uh, tonight, I'm going I'm to talk about, I'm going to begin with some basic science of climate change, and then I'm going to guide you to where we're going towards, where we're currently headed towards. And I believe right, we're going to have a follow-up about what's going on with the climate um, action plan in Swampscott. Yes, but you won't, not tonight. I know not tonight. No, not tonight. But so follow-up. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what we need to do, but it'll be a little bit like a cliffhanger uh, right next season where we're going to find out what we can do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, and Yaroslav is going to show the need of action. Uh, tonight and why we need to take action. So tonight I'm going to talk about the science of climate, why our climate's changing, what we can expect in the future, talk a little bit about changes specifically in New England and impacts on the North Shore, and then Yaroslav is going to provide uh, a youth voice. And I'm very excited that Yaroslav is going to join us because I teach, I teach climate change uh, a full semester scientific class, and um, at the end, a lot, of, a lot of young people feel very frustrated that they don't have a voice, that all the politicians are like in their 80s, and so Yaroslava uh, are going to join us to, to, to give us that voice. Um, right, I'm going to remind you, I, I, I do teach an entire semester uh, class on global climate change, and so tonight's an abbreviated version. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a few leaps and I'm more than happy to discuss uh, more intensely uh, some of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about tonight, but uh, I do understand that. So science, right, the, the key thing about science is it's a way that we can understand our world. And it's based on going out and making observations and looking at those observations and then coming up with some, some ideas of why things are happening the way they are. And so I'm going to show you a lot of graphs tonight, and together we will, we will see uh, uh, where we are moving. It's completely transparent. There's no secret recipe. There's no secret handshakes or anything like that, and we do experiments. And we've got, we've got some amazing tools at our disposal, and, and here's one I wanted to show you. This is, we've got thousands of these around the oceans. Uh, it, it measures salinity, temperature, and it sends uh, uh, information to uh, satellites. And so it, it, it drops down about 1,000 meters, and then it drifts around for nine days and takes temperature and salinity. Then it drops down to about 2,000 meters, and then it rises up to the surface, and it creates this profile of um, the uh, uh, temperature and salinity, and then it sends it off to a uh, receiving station. And this is just one bit of data. We have a lot of, a lot of different uh, ways of collecting data. I just wanted to show you uh, some of the amazing ways that we're, we're figuring out what's going on. And this is one of our conclusions. So I'm going to spend a second on this graph. So this is looking at, at global temperatures from 1850 to, to 2021. And along the bottom axis, is the dates going all the way back to 1850. The red dots are what we call anomalies, annual anomalies. How far did that year vary from an average of 1850 to 1900? So we take, we take all the data from, from 1850 to 1900 and we divide it by 50 and it gives us a long-term average. And then we compare each year to that long-term average and that red dot represents each year's uh, uh, anomaly difference from that long-term average. And those, those gray bars that you see going up and down, those are what we call error bars. And one thing we do in science is we show what we don't know as well as what we know. And so back in 1860, we didn't have as many thermometers around the world. We didn't have those things going bobbing in the ocean. And so we've got more error. But come the 1960s, you notice that those error bars almost disappear. We have a very, very good understanding of, of temperature. And what's happening is in that era between 1960 and 1980, our long-term climate started to change. For the past 8,000 years or so, we've had a, a, a climate where the temperature and precipitation, it would vary 
but it, it would always come back to a long-term normal. What's happening now is we've changed that trajectory. And the type of climate that we now live in is one that's continually warming. As you can see, uh, the, the axis has changed. So, the reason why we have the temperature that we have is, is the amount of incoming energy from the sun versus how much energy we send out to space. 99.99% of our energy on the surface of the Earth comes from the sun. There is a little bit of energy coming out of inside of the Earth, but, but it almost all comes from the sun. And every object that has any heat content radiates energy away, and so the Earth radiates that energy out to space. And so we've, we've, we've been measuring the sun, and, and a very, we've got satellites that, that, that pick up how much energy is coming from the sun. And the warming of Earth is not coming from incoming solar radiation. In fact, in fact uh, recently, solar radiation has been decreasing slightly. And if it was being driven by the sun, we would be getting cooler. But it's, it's, the, it's, it's our atmosphere. The energy the Earth is trying to escape, but there are certain gases in our atmosphere, right? Greenhouse gases. And they, they stop the Earth's energy from leaving. And, and, and our atmosphere has naturally had greenhouse gases in them. And the, the greenhouse gases have varied over time in our atmosphere. The difference today is that human activity is adding more and more of those greenhouse gases to our atmosphere. And the more greenhouse gases we add to our atmosphere, the Earth's energy tries to go out to space. Those molecules absorb that energy and re-radiate some back to Earth, making Earth warmer than it would otherwise be. So Earth is, Earth's temperature can be thought of as a bathtub. If the amount of incoming water equals the amount of outgoing water, that bathtub is going to stay level. But what we've done is we have, we've, we've tightened the outflow pipe. And what's happening is Earth is slowly filling up with heat. Just like a bathtub is slowly filling up and that little ducky's rising, the oceans are getting warmer. The rocks are getting warmer. The groundwater is getting warmer. It's a continuous thing that's happening now, just like this, this bathtub. We have, we, have, we have satellites that measure with great detail the amount of incoming solar radiation versus the amount of outgoing terrestrial radiation. And this is an image of, of Earth's energy leaving the Earth, where it's, where it's yellow to red is where there's a lot of energy leaving the Earth, where it's blue, there's not a lot of energy leaving the Earth. A lot of times clouds are stopping that energy from leaving. I could talk a, a couple of days about this one image, but I won't. Um, it's precise to say, we, one thing science does is quantify. We know pretty close to how much energy the Earth is, is, is retaining every hour as we fill up. So, right, we get this. This one is a, it's, it's similar to the graph I showed you, but this is one, two, three, four, five different organizations that have collected the data and monitored the data and in pretty strong agreement. Uh, one thing in science we try to find is many different ways of, of, of finding data and understanding things, and as many different scientists to study it. Uh, and where is that energy going? Most of it's going into our oceans. Our oceans are like batteries. They are, they've been absorbing that, that, that excess heat that we've been producing. That's one reason why we haven't been aware of what's going on, because most of that energy is being stored in, stored in the oceans. And that's why you will hardly find a lobster anymore in, in Long Island Sound. They're all migrating north to cooler waters. Um, right now, in our oceans, there are mass migrations going on. Right? Orca whales now can go up into the Arctic and they are, they're attacking whales and killing whales that they never crossed paths before. Off our, our shores now, right, we've got green crabs. Green crabs used to be down in south for hundreds of years. And now with the warmer waters, they're making their way up, up further north to where we live. Um, so, I'm going to go to the past for a second. And... Um, 
Understanding the path, past gives us a sense of what's happening now. Is, is what's happening now a natural thing that's always happened, or is it something that's unusual? And there's a lot of different ways that we can understand the path, past. And one of the coolest is, is ice cores. There's a couple miles of ice over Antarctica, over Greenland, and we drill these cores, and we can go back almost a million years. And inside those cores, are trapped air bubbles, so we know the concentration of chemicals in our atmosphere. We can also tell the temperature. There's a thing called oxygen isotope analysis, which I do make my GPH 115 class memorize how we get the temperature that way, but I'm not gonna, gonna do that tonight. Um, and so here's an example of a core. And here's a, here's, here's a graph. And so along the bottom is time. On the far right is today, and it's going back uh, 422,000 years. On the right-hand vertical column is, is temperature, and on the left-hand vertical column is carbon dioxide uh, concentration in the atmosphere called parts per million. And this is a, a classic style of, of presenting data in science where we take two different phenomena and we see if they're related to each other. And so temperature is in purple, carbon dioxide values are in yellow, and you can see over, over the past 400,000 years, uh, they've moved in tandem together. And, and, and increasing temperature increases carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere increases temperature, they work, they work side by side with each other. Also, I want you to notice um, I did have a laser pointer, but, but I haven't used it in years because of COVID, and it just didn't want to work, so, so I'm pointing. Um, I want you to notice one important thing. Notice that, that it, it slowly goes down, we're going to an ice age, and then it warms up pretty quickly. And then it cools down again to another ice age, then it warms up quickly. Um, there is the possibility that we can get very quick warming occurring because it's happened in the past. Here is another similar graph. So the bottom is the carbon uh, dioxide going up and down. This one goes back 800,000 years. Uh, this is from a Russian research station in Vostok in, in Antarctica. The top, the, the bottom one is, is, is temperature and the blue is carbon dioxide concentrations. And again, you can see they, they go next to each other, but notice where we are today. So that star is the current concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And from the beginning of those little dot, 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 dots, which is about the middle of the 1800s, we've put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than naturally has been, been put in the atmosphere uh, over the past 800,000 years. We are, we are, we are, are, are outside anything we've seen in a long time. And, if the laws of physics that worked 800,000 years ago, 400,000 years ago, still work today, temperature is going to follow. And the, 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 this is, this is in, in, in Mauna Loa in, in Hawaii, we're me we measure the concentration of different gases in our atmosphere because it's very far away from, from uh, any industrial areas. In 1958, we started collecting it, and you can see it zigzags from year to year due to photosynthesis, but we've been going up, 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 and we continue to go up. There is no sign in our atmosphere that humans are making any effort at decreasing carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And if you zoom in, I just did this, took this one. In May, we reached a new record. Now, that, now it drops down because a lot of plants pull the carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, here is, here is how much the world actually puts into the atmosphere, billions of tons of carbon. And so it starts in, in 1940, goes to the year 2000, and it goes up. And you can see that little blip, right? COVID did bring carbon dioxide down. Uh, we, we, we put only 35 billion tons instead of 37 billion tons in the atmosphere. Sometimes people are like, oh, COVID, it, you know, it, it, it brought down carbon dioxide so much they think it like went down to zero. Didn't even come close. Didn't even come close. Right, right. 
Here is methane. Methane is, is more than 20 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is, a, is, a, is an issue because it stays in the atmosphere for a thousand years. It's very difficult for carbon dioxide to leave the atmosphere. Methane, a few decades. Um, but notice, it starts in, in, in like 18, 8, 1983, I think. So it goes up in, the, in 2000, it starts to plateau. The, we're not putting more methane in the atmosphere. Then all of a sudden, fracking happens, right? Around 2005, and we start putting methane in the atmosphere. And now, we're, we're, we're building pipes all over the place for natural gas. Natural gas is methane. All around the world, we're ramping, right now, we're ramping up our production of methane. And look at it, it we're, we're, we're going like as fast as possible, putting methane into our atmosphere right now. Um, a few years ago, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is, a, is a, this massive international group of scientists that, that, that look at all the research that's going on, and then they, they put it in a publication that, that policymakers, governmental people, public can understand. And they said, said we, you know, the world should not warm more than 1.5 degrees Celsius from, from pre-industrial times, or we're going to be in trouble, basically. And then they give like 500 pages of what the trouble is going to be. So what that means is, right, a lot of towns and places um, are saying, oh, we're going to be carbon neutral at 2050. And so here's that same graph. And I, in, in Photoshop, just minutes before coming here, I, I showed what we have to do. And the X is probably where we actually are now, because this is, this is, is, is two years old. Um, we, as a global society, have to turn that down very quickly to get down to, to, to zero if we're, gonna, if we're gonna really be carbon neutral. A daunting task. And not only that, we need to, to, to then, once, once we get down to, to zero uh, carbon emissions, then we need to pull some of that carbon out of the atmosphere. We, right now, scientists feel like, like around 350 parts per million, which we passed in the late 1980s. Um, so we get to, to, to zero, car, zero neutral carbon by 2050, and then we've got to start, start pulling things out of there. One of the natural ways we do it are through trees, which we are currently cutting down at a, at a rapid rate also in the world. All right, what to expect in the future. So, I hope you have the relationship between greenhouse gases and temperature. Um, they are the, the, the often called the thermostat of the atmosphere. And here's a neat, this, this uh, you can see this graph. So in, in, in a 30 year period, 1951 to 1980, here's the normal distribution of summers in the northern hemisphere. We take all that data and we map it out and we've got the of the third uh, of high temperatures, the third of normal temperatures, and the third of cold temperatures. We maintain that, that, that diagram of what, what occurred in between 51 and, and 80, and now we, we add some new decades, and you can notice, again, it's just a, a different way to map out observations. And those observations have shown us how uh, the northern hemisphere during the summertime is clearly getting warmer and warmer and warmer. What, what, what used to be average cold is rare cold these days. And here's a graph of, this is for the United States, number of daily heat and cold records broken by year. So one of the things that's happening now is minimum temperatures are rising faster than the hot temperatures, the top temperatures. So winters are not as cold as they used to be. Nights are not as cold as they used to be. And, and you can see the number of, of, of record cold has dropped dramatically, where we're still breaking records of, of high temperatures. And in Europe, this is the United States, here's Europe, um, 1950 uh, to fairly recent, and you can see the same thing. They are, they, their minimum temperatures, they're no, almost, no, almost, no longer breaking cold temperatures. 
We've almost completely, they've almost completely shifted out of, of uh, that paradigm and they still break uh, hot records. All right. This is an important graph. Um, what this graph is showing us, along the bottom, this is an eye test also, see if you're going to be able to, to allow to drive home tonight if you can't read this, but along the bottom is temperature in Fahrenheit going from 0 to 20 to 40 to 60 to 80 to 100 to 120. And the vertical column is a, a volume of moisture. And what this graph is showing us, as, as, as temperature increases, as we go from the left to the right, the amount of moisture the atmosphere can hold increases. So, and you've probably heard of the thing, um, it's too cold to snow, right? When it's near zero degrees Fahrenheit, there's almost no moisture whatsoever in the atmosphere. And one thing I want you to notice, these, the each dot is, is, is 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you can see, as, as it gets warmer, the, the, the ability to hold moisture increases dramatically. That's why, as the Earth warms up, we're going to see more intense droughts and more intense flooding. The atmosphere, I mean, it's physics. The atmosphere can hold more moisture, so when, when it's warm, that energy evaporates the water from the soil and the air, it doesn't precipitate out because the air's got a lot more room to hold it. So we get these prolonged droughts, which we're seeing. When it does fill up and decides to rain, it's a lot more water available than in the past. And so we get these floods. So you tell me what the future is, right? Greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise. With that, Earth's temperature continues to rise. And with that, the ability to hold moisture increases. And there's no sign of, of, of greenhouse gases even starting to make a, make a move. I love graphs. Sometimes my class is just graphs. This is, is Australia. And along the bottom, is average annual daily temperature, and the, the vertical column is annual total precipitation. And we've got these 20-year these, these eras. So in the early eras, we're, we're 1910 to 1939, 40 to 59, 60 to 79, 80 to 8, 99, and then 2000 to 2019. And you can see one thing that certainly is happening, Australia is getting warmer, right? Those red dots are the most recent and the black dots are the furthest. And so you can really see over, over these 20 year periods of progression. Also, what's happening is it's getting wetter some years and it's getting drier some years. That, that, that there, you can see the, some of the red ones were up really high. There were some, some very wet years and down below uh, some very dry years. In 2019, I don't know if you remember, of the continent of Australia almost completely burned virtually, right? There were fires. And then the year after, 2020, there were massive floods. So our future is going to see, um, it's going to get warmer, no question about it, and we're going to see these ex excessive droughts and, and floods. Some parts of the world are going to get hit harder than other parts, um, certainly, um, right? This summer, the southwest, Right, Lake Mead, uh, Lake Powell, the, the two biggest uh, man-made lakes in the country are, 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 are almost out of water. Lake Mead now is 27% of its capacity. And for the past 40 years or so, the Southwest has been booming with population. One thing I think is going to happen in the future, 10 years, 15 years, there's going to be mass migration to New England. Um, the Southwest is going to run out of water. Um, if, 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 if physics continues the same, right? Europe was, was the, the rivers were so dry, World War II ships were showing, uh, China had this terrible thing, and then floods. Death Valley in three hours almost had an entire year's worth of rainfall. Um, Dallas, Texas went from extreme drought 
to a thousand-year flood. And you've, you've probably heard that a lot this summer, right? Thousand-year, we used to, a hundred-year flood used to be the thing you'd hear about. Now we're hearing thousand-year floods, and what a thousand-year flood means is that there's a one in 1,000 chance that a flood like that's gonna happen. Um, and I'm, I'm working on a paper with, with, a, with a group of people from, from China and uh, Germany, and um, it started in January, and we're, we're mapping 1,000-year floods and a 5,000-year flood in Shanghai, and I thought, that's ridiculous. After the summer, oh my God, it might, it, we might, we might in, in five years' time, we might be seeing 5,000-year floods instead of 1,000-year floods. How about this? This is, this is Billion Dollar Disasters, 20, uh, 1960 to 2021, spring, summer, fall, winter. Uh, springtime, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's still some residual uh, 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 winter storms, but a lot of tornado activity. Summer, we're seeing those mega uh, hurricanes. But you can see, it's going to cost us a lot of money, right? Ian was unbelievably powerful. It, it was what, like a Category 1 after, after Cuba, and, it, and because the oceans are heating up so much, it ramped up to a Category 4 in no time. Um, New England, uh, so um, I, uh, I, I published a paper at the end of last year, looked at uh, different weather stations in New England, and uh, the bottom is, is time from 1900 uh, to 2020 decades. Again, uh, anomalies, meaning how far has, has those decades uh, uh, differed from the long-term average. The blue line is minimum temperature, the gray line is maximum temperature, and the orange line is average temperature. And so recently we can see that, that again, minimum temperature is rising faster. Our winters are, 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 are disappearing. Here is, here is uh, over the winter time, uh, the minimum temperatures have, have, have risen in, uh, in um, New England, more than three degrees Celsius, which is, more, which is almost six degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and compared to the globe, the global change is the blue line, New England is the orange line. We're, we're heating much faster than the global average. Um, partly because we're in a northern climate, and northern climates tend to be moving faster, and second of all, because the Gulf of Maine, which is just offside our shores, is one of the fastest heating bodies of water uh, on Earth. And so we're getting some of that heat from there as well. Remember, the oceans are, are, are those great storers of, of uh, snow cover. Um, snow cover uh, reflects sunlight and that energy doesn't get transferred to Earth, it goes back out to space. When there's no snow cover, it doesn't reflect, and the, and the Earth absorbs that energy. So one thing, I did a paper uh, a couple years ago looking at temperature and snow cover. And where you see the kind of uh, um, uh, bluish, greenish colors, it means that's where snow cover is disappearing and it's heating up because there's no snow cover. So one thing that's happening in New England, and, and I'm, I'm sure you've noticed it, we don't get as much snow. We don't get as many days. Sometimes we'll get a huge snowstorm because the atmosphere has a lot of moisture, but there's not as many days with snow cover. So instead of reflecting the sunlight, we're absorbing that light, that energy. So not only is the greenhouse effect warming the earth, but the, the diminishing snow and ice is also uh, heating us up. Just a little bit more. The other day, last semester, a student asked me, why all of a sudden scientists are like now finally studying climate change? I have a, I have, I have a half a class lecture on this, but we've known it for a long time, right? The first publication about global warming due to human emissions of CO2 was 1896. ExxonMobil scientists saw that the greenhouse, that, that the burning of fossil fuels was putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It was going to make the world warmer, and they told their executives, and they shut down the scientific program uh, at, at, at ExxonMobil. 
Jim Hansen, the, the top NASA scientist, talked in front of Congress and said, we're 99% sure the world is warming and we have to stop burning fossil fuels right away. More than 30 years ago, told the politicians, told the, told the energy executives. So, uh, climate change vulnerabilities for Essex County, New England, definitely health issues are going to be huge. Uh, um, uh, we're, it's going to get hotter, uh, there's going to be strong heat waves, uh, there's a lot of issues with, with, with temperature and pollution. Um, new diseases are coming in that can, that can survive. For example, the spread of Lyme disease uh, in places where it's never been before. Uh, rising sea levels and storm activity. I know, I know those of you who live near the coast have seen it and it's just, just beginning. Um, species migration, right? Talked about the ocean, lack of winter snow, um, increased pests, uh, increased precipitation and drought. Uh, extreme weather swings, disruptions to our, 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 our fishing uh, and agricultural society. And on the issue of, of climate justice, there are members of, of Essex County, uh, marginalized populations, that, that a lot of them don't have any air conditioning or access to air conditioning, both rural and urban. Also, uh, difficulties with health care and don't always, always, always can uh, go get health care when, when they need it. Um, also, changes in agricultural and fisheries uh, will be especially hard on marginalized populations who don't have the capital or access to capital to change uh, their fishing gear and the like, or, or day laborers uh, when species change over. Marginalized populations tend to live in, in more polluted areas. Um, for example, gas leaks. My colleague Marcos Luna did a study of, of gas leaks in New England or in Massachusetts and found brown and black people, it's something like weeks later that they get attention compared to, to, to white neighborhoods. Um, so I have to put a plug in for my department. Um, we're actively involved in, in uh, studying climate change and, and involved in community activity. Um, We've, and, and I've got students who are doing a much more detailed plan of uh, sea level rise. Uh, the Great Marsh is ground zero uh, for sea level rise. Uh, parts of Lynn are ground zero also. Uh, later on, uh, other places are going to, to get the effect of it. We're still, well, this is Newburyport, this is, this is a king tide. We're still building right on the coast. So our future has arrived, um, our climate, which has been stable for 8,000 years, has changed. And our, our economic system in which we function with, which, which, which did a great job of, of survival and prosperity for many, uh, no longer works. And if we don't change, right, right now, the fossil fuel industry is making, making some of the largest profits they've ever made. And none of those profits are going into the to pay for the destruction of, of what's happening. We're ramping up our, our fossil fuel production. We're not, we're not ramping it down. All right, hopefully you feel a sense of urgency and hopefully we can get others to feel a sense of urgency. Um, we need to do what we can, uh, stop putting greenhouse gases. Uh, we need to engage in a, a social environmental justice accountability, and being in a, being in a sanctuary, um, I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church and we've got these seven uh, principles. And, and as a scientist, I feel very comfortable being here because science is a, is a, is a way to understand the world and spirituality is a, is a sense of caring. And so the synergy, I think, between, between science and religion or spirituality is, is a great, uh, uh, thing. Okay, um, that is is the science of climate change, and I am going to uh, ask Yaroslava if she could come up, and uh, and then we'll have question time for questions afterwards, um, to 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 come up and speak. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, I would like to start off by thanking Dr. Young for his amazing presentation. And additionally, the Swampscott Conservancy and the Uni Unitarian Universalist Church for hosting this event and everyone present here for attending. Climate change is an issue that I have been passionate about for many years, and I'm very happy to have been given the opportunity to share my experiences and reflections on the issue today as a representative of the Youth Voice. My name is Yaroslava Sharyayeva, and I'm 16 years old, a senior at Swampscott High School. Since learning about climate change four years ago, I've become involved in multiple youth organizations, most notably FXB Climate Advocates, um, and have, through these organizations, had many meaningful discussions with other youth about their perspective on climate change. Although we may hold different opinions and different beliefs about the best solutions, I have found that youth as a population share three essential feelings about the climate situation. First, we feel endangered. The magnitude of climate change, the irreversibility of its effects, and the severity of its impacts push the omnipresent threat of global warming to the forefront of our consciences. Our senses are overwhelmed by climate change and our minds consumed by it. The glare from each electric light, the hiss of the motor each time we turn on the car, the plastic and styrofoam containers that line our refrigerators, we cannot escape the daily reminders that society is pursuing our demise abatelessly. To be a youth today is to watch one's future slipping from the fingers of society and waiting, breathless, for the inevitable hollow chime announcing its spontaneous implosion into a million shining shards. We lose our sanity calculating over and over again the time we have left to make amends, and we never have a moment's rest. Second, we feel bewildered. We cannot understand and are unprepared to deal with the contradictions of adults who acknowledge the issue and yet fail to act. Faced with such a monumental threat, the absence of meaningful progress on climate solutions is inexplicable. While new scientific findings are affirming daily the urgent need for climate solutions, the fact remains that knowledge of this problem has existed for decades and no action has been taken. The world still does not recognize climate change as an imminent threat, and our cries still fail to puncture the thick fog of complacency that has descended upon our society. We worry that we must be crazy when we deliver news of tragedy and yet fail to instigate emotion. When we scream, our future is in jeopardy and yet observe the world continuing as though it could never die. When we feel that our life is in danger and yet our society continues to endorse our killers. We are confounded by the utter disconnect between our demands and the world's responses. Third, despite everything, we feel hopeful. When viewed alongside the history of climate action and the extent to which our government is willing to senselessly follow archaic business models instead of protecting their global interests that lie in the lives of their citizens, our hope is inexplicable, futile, yet ever resilient. Hope is the hallmark of the youth movement, but while it sustains us, it can also work against us. When we are celebrated for our hope, attention is diverted from the fact that we have not yet achieved the necessary results. The fact that we are the only ones bearing the responsibility for spreading this message and for finding solutions is not cause for celebration. We are lauded as inspirational, but this to me is a mistranslation. Our words, though filled with hope, are not meant to be optimistic. We do not live on an indulgent, naive hope, but a desperate hope. We have no alternative but to hope, for to resist hope is to admit defeat, and to admit defeat is to die. So that we have no reason to, we keep hoping. To conclude my presentation, I would like to communicate three asks to our adult allies in this room. Our future is precarious, so I ask that you take responsibility for your individual role in fueling climate change and hold others accountable to the same standards. Our anxiety is incompatible with society's complacency, so I ask that you affirm our right to be concerned by treating climate change like the crisis that it is. Our hope is unsupported by any results that we have seen. So I ask the audience here today to legitimize our hope with quantifiable action. Thank you.
have any questions for, for either of us? Thank you for the presentation, both of you. Um, I think those of us who are here are certainly on board with the concerns that you've expressed and the direness of the situation. I know a lot of people who hate cold winters are not so worried about it. And I'm wondering if you have um, sort of compelling arguments when we're in discussions or trying to make a point uh, with our legislators for why it's so bad in, in a way that is um, easy to communicate and understand in a short period of time. A lot of people are not that invested in learning in depth, but those of us who understand what's going on are very concerned. It's hard to express that concern when people are saying, well, it's not so bad to not have it be that cold anymore. Sure, and, and, and maybe someone else has, has a, a better idea how to communicate that. I, I'm, my brain's too full of, of graphs and diagrams. But um, one, one aspect is, is just cost. It, the, these, these disasters that we're getting, not just in dollars, but right, lost lives, lost family photo albums, lost pets, lost no insurance, um, rest of their life uh, in debt. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing more and more of these natural disasters that are, that are climate driven and, and just dollar wise. Um, that's one, that's one, one uh, thing. How about somebody else has, I mean, you, some of you must have, have a way to talk to, to others. Well, what's, what strikes me is that uh, for a long, long time, there's, it's been, the, the scientific argument has been very clear. And as uh, lucidly as that could be explained, uh, it wasn't a good story. It was too difficult to understand. So maybe what we really need, and I, I hate to draw, I, I'm not quite sure how to say this uh, politely, but you know, people can see what's happened in Florida with Ian, and that's a story. That, I mean, that is emotional to look at, to watch. Uh, so many people from New England have moved to Florida, the snowbirds, and, you know, I've struggled for a long time with how we get over the hump of uh, knowing, knowing what's right and wrong and being able to act on it and having that critical mass to uh, join us in some action and some recognition. So perhaps it's the, uh, uh, you know, what we've seen on our TV screens that uh, can help push us over the top. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree about Ian, but I have, I have another uh, uh, question. Um, I've seen um, a flood map that would be the result of a thousand year storm in Salem. Uh, my house would be on an island. Uh, friends' houses down the street would be partly at least under water. And the point I want to make is that if you show people thousand-year flood maps of the entire coastline of the United States, especially what could be the former state of Florida, I think you're going to start getting some action out of people and action from politicians. There's at least two U.S. senators that might like to represent Florida if Florida continues to exist. And I think that's one way to reach people. Uh, 
Um, I guess I'm a bit of a pessimist when it comes to convincing people of anything because I know there are people who will just deny uh, or rely on false facts that they hear um, in other news outlets. And I, I'm a firm believer that what we need is legislation and we need, you know, um, uh, act, you know, the law. Maybe that's because I'm a lawyer, <laughs> it comes out, but we need, you know, change in that way. Um, and there are a group of, you know, committed people to this and we're the ones that have to push. And as I hear, there are a group of uh, the youth that are um, invested in this. And I guess I have a question for Yaroslava, which is I, I, I think perhaps like adults, there's um, a, a segment of you know, high school students and maybe college students that aren't invested that just sort of put it out of their mind. And I guess is there some way to reach the youth because they're, I think, where our hope is. Um, and I don't know if there is, but if there is, and we can help do that, uh, whether it's coming to the school and making presentations or, or whatever, um, that would be helpful. And if you have any ideas on that, that would be great to hear. Absolutely. Um, I think that the number one thing that everybody can do to get more people involved in general and youth specifically is just to um, affirm the affirm the urgency of the of the of climate change really because I think that a lot of youth we don't see people acting so they it's easy enough to put out of your head um, and it's easy for many people that I know to put homework ahead of it um, to put activities ahead of it, to just not think about it, because it's still not something that society as a whole is concerned about enough. We don't, even though it's in the media, we don't hear about it enough, and um, the adults and the government around us does not treat it like it's so urgent, so it's easy enough for us to believe that it isn't, if we're not willing to put in the time and effort. It's not the norm to believe in it still, um, even after so long. Um, so I think that the most important thing to do is just to uh, treat it as a crisis, treat it as an emergency in, in everything that you're doing and make, um, and make the conscious effort to take action every day um, and then it will spread because other people will feel the same sort of sense of insecurity um, if you project that uh, and will be motivated to take action. Um, uh, maybe to give a little positive tone to the, to the thoughts. Um, I saw on TV yesterday that BU is about to open a new computer center and it is going to be 100% um, sustainable in terms of um, heating and cooling by geothermal um, you know, sources and the, the building is designed to not use energy to be, uh, whatever the term is, energy neutral. I understand that our new elementary school here in Swampscott, a lot of effort has been put into thinking about um, making the building as green as possible. And, and they're going to be using uh, geothermal sources as well. Um, so I, I think there are some, you know, the technology maybe is, is developing and being accepted slower than your curves. So we may end up being in a lot of trouble anyway, but I, I think there are efforts to, to try that I've seen just, just recently. I wanted, on that, on that topic, I wanted to ask you, Steve, if, if you had any thoughts about this movement to um, electric vehicles and um, electric heat pumps the thing that I've never been able to understand about that is that is it 50% of our electricity is being generated by natural gas? So I, I, have, you, have you looked into that or do you know uh, of any sources? Is, is this really a, a viable solution? So first of all, um, on the positive side, 
Uh, Sam State also is, uh, our library is run on geothermal energy. We have lots of solar panels on, on our buildings. We have a decarbonization plan for our North Campus. So we've been, we've been very active uh, in, in that positive realm. And uh, like you said, there is, there really is, the, there's, the, there's the technology, we've got the technology, we've got the finance, um, we've got the know-how, it's the, it's the will uh, that, that we're missing. And um, as far as electrification, so we're, we're moving society to be more electrified uh, uh, so that we will burn less fossil fuels, but right, right a lot of electricity is produced by, by natural gas. So we have to move uh, uh, on two fronts. One, um, being more efficient with our use of energy. And um, maybe, maybe also um, uh, some degrowth. We don't have to always be consuming more and more and more. Uh, another thing is uh, wind power, and we need to ramp up uh, those alternative energy sources. And uh, however, we need to be very careful, careful about it. I have a, a graduate student, she happens to be from Brazil, and she's studying deforestation in Massachusetts. And about 40% of Massachusetts deforestation right now is to build solar farms, especially in the Berkshires. We're, we're cutting down large swaths of forest to, to put in uh, solar panels. And so um, we've gotta be, we've gotta, meanwhile, Right, all the Walmarts and Home Depots and stuff have nothing on the roofs and all these massive parking lots we could have. Can't. So we need to do it in a smart way uh, to electrify, but we definitely need to move in that, that direction. I um, I'm I'm monitoring the Facebook feed for questions. Oh, nice. Yeah, this is from Swampscott Climate Action and Resilience Coalition, who says that we are working on a climate action plan for Swampscott. What are a few key actions we can implement that will make a significant impact for our small and densely populated town? Thoughts on managed retreat from the coastline. So um, ultimately, parts we're going to have to retreat, and also not necessarily necessarily swamp scott, but other areas we need to to set aside land where marshland can move inland. Right, uh, the salt marshes are the beginning of the food chain uh, for the oceans, and so as sea level rises and the marshes can't keep up with the rising, they're going to move inland. So we need to to protect land where we need, to, we need to stop thinking our, our world is, is stable, it's now unstable. And so we need to figure out where we need to move inland. We've gotta stop building on, on coastal areas and uh, um, move, yeah, yeah, we do need to retreat in some places. Anybody else here? I want I don't want to I don't want to uh, hog the mic. You're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> I I I'm the expert in, in understanding the science of climate change. And um, so actionable items certainly the, the the biggest problem is the structure in which we live our lives is built uh, for the old climate. And so we need to change that structure. We need to, we need to build, finish building the um, rail trail. I, I saw a thing in the paper, I don't know if people ever saw it, in Portland every week, all the hundreds of, of elementary school kids bike to school and the parents get on the porch and, and, and cheer them on. And so we need to, to start biking to high school, to middle school. We need to have a safe path like that, that rail trail. We built, you know, a, a, a bridge that gets, has some problems with it for cars, we fix it right away. But a rail trail that's gonna be safe for, for us to transport, oh, we can, we'll finish that in years. We need, to, we need to change the structure in which we live as quickly as possible. That's what we have to do. Yeah, we need, we need when, when you're out on, on Kings Beach and you look up and there are so many roofs that are perfectly pointed to the sun, to, to, power, to power solar energy. Meanwhile, we're cutting down 
trees in, in the Berkshires to get our electricity. There's so many places in Swampscott where we could be generating solar power, um, where we could be having, I'm, I'm glad we're, we're building some safe bike lanes, but there's a lot more we can do. The structure of, of how we live our lives has to change. And we need to do it at the local level as well as the national level. Was there any, uh, were there any other uh, comments from? No. Okay. Okay. I think I heard you said it, in 10 to 15 years there will be a mass migration to New England as the water in the Southwest, you know, disappears. Why New England? You know why? When, 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 when you look at a map, so I saw a map the other day that NASA put out of what the temperature is going to be like in continental United States in, in 2100. North Dakota is going to be hotter than Phoenix today. And, and much, much of New England is the one place that's actually, even though we're heating up really quickly, New England in the long run is going to, because we're, we're farther north than a lot of other places, we're going to, be, we're going to have a, a, a milder climate. But people are already, we've got friends in, in, in Vermont who work for the government, and there's a fair number of Californians moving to Vermont because in California, right, there's the fires, the floods, the drought, and Vermont is, is kind of a similar political environment for, for some people, and so they're moving. I read a thing in the Globe last year from people from Texas moving up to Maine. So it, it's already started, um, but, but, but yeah, I'll stop there. So I saw an article where in Europe they have plants designed to pull CO2, not, not flowering plants, but right. physical buildings, designed to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. Is that an approach that you think could have an impact? We have to do everything, yeah. So, so um, you know, there is, there is a sense that technology is going to save us, right? That's that, that, that we're going to build these plants somehow and it's going to suck all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and we're going to be fine. That's not going to happen. However, we, we need to do everything that's, that's, that's disposable to us. So the idea of, of building material that absorbs carbon dioxide, absolutely, as well as, as reforestation projects and things like that. Yep, yep. One thing, we, we humans are, are really has great ingenuity. And, and we've been able to, to the, the scientific stuff that we have to measure temperature and things are phenomenal. And the, 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 the architecture and things that we, we can build is phenomenal. We just, we just need to, to, to shift that, that economic system to, to instead of um, giving the fossil fuel industry, you know, excess of uh, um, uh, profits, we need to, to have people that, that create buildings like that to get the profits. Our economic system has it's, it's been around since the 50s, really, the consumer way. We can change it. I have two, two points. Um, I think because we just went through a massive seawall build, we, made, we built a revetment wall, not a concrete. Um, we did a lot of research about sea level rise. We watched it, unfortunately, in our yard for 20 years. So I started doing a lot of research, and I think if every high school student watches the, um, the studies on the Chesapeake Bay, Right now, what we're worrying about in 10 years, they're already dealing with. I mean, this is real. And so I think that's one of the things that you have to show a real tangible thing. And also, I mean, I speak, um, my sister-in-law just had the, you know, the, the, the drive to create electric buses on the vineyard and charging stations around. I mean, it's a, a perfect, perfect, solution for CO2 and all that. And she was met with incredible resistance because it required taking down one tree, one tree. So I think that this, you know, the common sense, people are just throwing common sense out the window. And here's this very energetic person who's is in love with the vineyard and trying to do something 
and she is met with incredible resistance and they, they fight her all the way and they postpone it and meetings and meetings and other meetings. And I think people get ex tired, they get exhausted because, you know, I mean, I know what we went through with all of the regulations with our seawall. I mean, we, we're protecting 14 homes that were damaged for, since we've been there for 25 years. And all we did was get hit with resistance. And it, it was very frustrating for us, so. Those are my two points. There is a book, there's a book that was put out, um, I think it was 2015, called Drawdown. Mm. And it's the comprehensive plan for, uh, that's you know, proposed for uh, drawing down, not just getting to 1.5, but drawing down. And there's a whole, it's like 100, examples of how you can do this. It's called Drawdown. It's something that everybody should have who's an environmentalist, and I have it on my Kindle. <laughs> and that's why, that, that's one of your questions as to how this can be done. One of those things might be those, kind of, those kinds of plants, but there's tons of ways to draw down if you put your mind to do it and do it. Right, if we, just, our, we have if, to get people. if we put our will to it. Right, right, and that's, I think that's the first step and that's what the youth is trying to tell us, get moving, start this going. You know, we know that there's things out there, let's just do them and start working on them. So we in this small compact town need to, need to, to start to act and draw down and, 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 and do that. Be an example. All right, we've passed our time. We've passed our time and I, um you know, I want to encourage from the, the ministry side also to say, take some time to process this, you know. There's the, it, we talked a little bit about the importance of the emotional uh, connection and the urgency, and it can be very easy for it to hit us, you know. Maybe not you, have been working at this for decades, but for, you know, for some of us taking the time to really process it emotionally so that we're ready um, and prepared to act together, staying connected, you know, within the church, within um, the Swamp Scott Conservancy, thinking about actions together and, you know, come away with some commitments. So, thank you so much. We have a, a round of applause, please.